me start the recording. Share my screen. Oh, right here. All right, so you should see the syllabus. Today is February 9th, and we are going to be working on Chapter 5, Microbial Metabolism. Hopefully we'll finish that chapter today. Please note that this Wednesday at 11.59, you will be taking quiz number 3. I think it's the 3A and 3B. And that quiz covers labs 5 and 6. And chapter 4 and the end of chapter 3. Chapter 5 will not be on this quiz. Any questions? All right, let's move forward. Let me see if I can see anyone. Nope. Uh, if you don't mind my seeing someone, I can get verbal feedback when you show a picture just to let you know and nobody's showing me their picture so I won't have any did I say verbal feedback I'll be able to see a nonverbal feedback I'm gonna leave this up because I'll use it in the lab later I do have one question though or uh -huh. what we cover tonight is that going to be on the considered to be on the test for tomorrow I just answered that. No, if you remember from the syllabus, it covers uh, chapter four and the end of chapter three and labs five and six. All right, so uh, let's begin. Uh, we were on this slide last time, and so we were talking about how cells can make ATP from catabolism. What did I just do? And uh, uh, they have two general processes for doing that respiration, including aerobic respiration, which we're going to be talking about very shortly, and anaerobic respiration. Uh, and those are the two types of respiration. And then there's also uh, fermentation. Cells can make ATP from fermentation. Uh, so let's look at an overview of the uh, processes of aerobic respiration and fermentation. Uh, aerobic respiration has three princi principal steps. Glycolysis, shown here. Uh, the Krebs cycle, shown here. And then lastly, the electron transport chain, or ETC, shown here. Uh, essentially, the electrons are flowing from glucose, which starts here. That's not shown, but starts here and enters glycolysis. And then the electrons flow to CO2 right there and water right there. Both of CO2 and water are energy poor and glucose is energy rich. Uh, the energy being in the chemical bonds of the molecules. And there's a high ATP yield in aerobic respiration. Okay. Uh, our cells, at least our muscle cells, as well as bacteria cells, can also make uh, ATP from fermentation. Fermentation does involve glycolysis, but there's no Krebs cycle. There's no electron transport chain. And instead of going this way, uh, the electrons go this way. And uh, they make, in glycolysis, uh, pyruvate or pyruvic acid. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then the electrons uh, flow to some uh, end product of fermentation. That might be ethanol or lactate. There's a much lower ATP yield in fermentation compared to aerobic respiration. Any questions about that? Remember, this is just the overview. We'll talk about these steps in much greater detail in a little bit. 
Uh, this is another overview of aerobic respiration showing you the three steps. Glycolysis, which happens in a cell. And you can think of the colored, I don't know, pinkish or slightly purplish uh, box here being the cell. And glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. And during glycolysis, the cell does make ATP, and then glucose is converted into pyruvate. And we'll talk more about the NADH. It's carrying the electrons to the electron transport change. The pyruvate then goes from the cytoplasm into, at least in eukaryotes, into the mitochondria and in the inner mitochondrial membrane called the matrix that's where the Krebs cycle happens and the Krebs cycle is also called the citric acid cycle some ATP is made CO2 is generated and uh, uh, some of the electrons go from the Krebs cycle to uh, the electron transport chain, which is also called oxidative phosphorylation and a couple of other terms. We'll talk about that later. We'll just call it the electron transport chain right now because that's the one I use. And uh, in this part of aerobic respiration, ATP production is kicked into high gear. And it doesn't show it here, but the electrons flow to uh, water. Uh, oxygen is, we're really accepting it, and oxygen is converted into water. And this, the electron transport chain, happens on and across the inner mitochondrial membrane in eukaryotes. Uh, we'll talk about prokaryotes in a little bit. All right, any question about any of this? You should note that aerobic respiration is also called cellular respiration, and so you'll have to need to know both of those terms. All right, if there's no questions, let's move on to talking about aerobic respiration. It starts with glycolysis, and in reality, all forms of respiration, meaning anaerobic or aerobic, start with glycolysis. Uh, glycolysis has another term, but I don't use it. I think it's mentioned one place in your book, it's right there. Uh, like I said, I'll never ask you what's the emden Mayerhoff pathway. I'll always refer to it as glycolysis. Uh, glycolysis is the oxidation of glucose to pyruvic acid. It occurs in most living cells, so most cells can engage in glycolysis. And glycolysis can occur in the presence or in the absence of oxygen. It doesn't use oxygen, so it doesn't need oxygen, but it can occur when oxygen is around. It does produce ATP and NADH, All right, any questions about this? This is still a little bit of an overview, uh, but this is specifically of this part of aerobic respiration. And remember, glycolysis starts out the aerobic respiration as well as it starts out uh, fermentation, and we'll talk about that when we're done talking about uh, respiration. So glycolysis has uh, nine or ten steps, and the important thing to remember is, is that it starts generally with glucose, and if it isn't glucose, that molecule, meaning it's some other molecule like a complex carbohydrate or even a lipid or a protein, most of the time those molecules will be converted into glucose, and then glucose will start the aerobic respiration. Any question about that? Let me see if I can blow this up a little. Yeah, it's a little better. Uh, so that's glucose. 
And you'll notice that we take some, uh, we don't need to see that, we take some ATP in glycolysis, one here and one there, that molecule is converted into this molecule. You don't need to know the name of it, glucose 6-phosphate. Converted into that one, converted into that one, and then converted into these two. And glucose was a six-carbon molecule shown here. Each of these circles is one of the carbons of glucose. And so it makes two, three carbon molecules. This molecule is converted into that one, and then this one this pathway will run twice because that one's converted into there. And uh, we generate NADH right here, and we generate 2-ATP right here, and one water there, and 2-ATP uh, here. And then the glucose is converted into pyruvic acid, and there are two pyruvic acids because this molecule is converted into that molecule. Any question about that? Now let me state that pyruvic acid and pyruvate are used interchangeably. They are chemically different. One has the hydrogen attached to it, the other doesn't. But your cells use pyruvic acid and pyruvate the same. And so we will use those two words interchangeably, even though they are chemically slightly different. Any questions about that? I'm having a bad hair day today. My hair isn't behaving. Uh, now I should state that I was required to uh, learn this pathway when I was an undergraduate, and I was required to learn the enzymes that did each pathway. And since I was required to learn that as an undergraduate, I think it's fair for me to require you guys to learn it. What do you think of that? No, thanks. Hmm. Uh, you don't need to know that. You do need to know the summary reaction or equation for glycolysis, and that is you start with two glucose and you end up, excuse me, not two glucose, you start with glucose and you end up with pyruvic acid and there's two of them. And then you um, get a net gain of two ATP from glycolysis. I already mentioned you get two pyruvic acids and you also get a net gain of 2-NADH. You do need to know that it starts with glucose and then ends with this red box. Okay, any question about that? By net gain, 2-ATP. Remember, we take in 2-ATP to get glycolysis running, but we get out 4-ATP. So it's a net gain of 2 ATP from glycolysis. Any question about that? And this happens in the cytoplasm of a eukaryotic cell. Of course, it always happens in the cytoplasm of a prokaryotic cell because there isn't anything else besides the cell membrane. Recall that there's more than one form of respiration. There's respiration and aerobic respiration, meaning anaerobic respiration and aerobic respiration. <clears throat> Both of them are the oxidation of molecules releasing electrons for the electron transport chain. Those molecules generally start from glucose, but they can start from any food molecule that you are digesting. And just if you're a couch potato, that molecule will be converted into glucose and then sent down aerobic respiration the normal way. Uh, aerobic respiration has oxygen as the final electron acceptor, right there. And anaerobic respiration has another molecule other than oxygen as the final electron acceptor. 
Generally, anaerobic respiration has the same steps as aerobic respiration, <clears throat> but the last step is very different. The, oxygen, the electrons do not flow to oxygen. They flow to some other molecule. It might be a nitrogenous compound. It could be a sulfate or a sulfur compound. It could be a iron compound. It just depends on what form of anaerobic respiration the cell is engaging in. Uh, the point of it is for uh, ATP to be generated mainly by the electron transport chain. All right, any question about that? All right, so uh, once glycolysis happens, uh, pyruvic acid cannot directly enter the Krebs cycle. It needs to be changed, and it's oxidated and decarboxylated, meaning a carbon comes off. Where is it? Right there, this carbon coming off. And coenzyme A attaches to it right there. And so it's changed from pyruvic acid into acetyl coenzyme A. And this happens in one step, and it's called the preparatory step because we're preparing the pyruvic acid for entry into the Krebs cycle. Now, uh, the pyruvic acid is a three carbon molecule and it's converted into acetyl coenzyme A, which is a two carbon molecule. And so one carbon comes off as CO2. And this is the first burning of the carbon of uh, glucose into CO2. We do generate some NADH. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The preparatory step runs two times for a molecule of glucose. Why does it run two times? Because there's two pyruvic acids that come out of the glycolysis. Can you say that again? I didn't quite hear that. There's two uh, pyruvic acids that come out of the glycolysis. Right. Uh, glucose is converted into py two pyruvic acids. And so the preparatory step is going to run two times for each molecule of glucose. Very good. Thank you for contributing. This class is not very good about uh, uh, adding to the lecture or talking. And try and be a little better about that. It does help you as well as helping the lesson. Uh, so the next step of aerobic respiration is the Krebs cycle, and you should know that the Krebs cycle has other names. Generally, I will refer to it as the Krebs cycle, and your textbook, assuming you have the uh, uh, edition for Clark College, also refers to it as the Krebs cycle. But some other authors, as well as just the fact that it has different names, some people call it the tri carboxylic acid cycle, or TCA for short, and it's also called the citric acid cycle, and that still is abbreviated TCA, T for the, C for citric, and then A for acid. Okay? Any question about that? All right? No. Uh, so we'll call it the Krebs cycle. Uh, the Krebs cycle, uh, we're seeing the preparatory step here, really doesn't start until after the preparatory step, changing the pyruvic acid into acetyl coenzyme A. The coenzyme A comes off, and then the acetyl part joins up with oxyl. Uh, let me blow this up. You can read that. Uh, joins up with oxaloacetic acid, 
and then form citric acid. And citric acid is converted to this molecule, converted to that molecule, and NADH is generated in CO2 right here. This molecule is converted into that molecule, and CO2 and NADH is generated right here. This molecule is converted into that molecule. ATP is generated right here. And then that molecule is generated into that molecule. We generate FADH2 right here. That molecule is converted into that molecule. And that molecule is converted into that molecule. And NADH is involved in that step. And this is oxaloacetic acid. The molecule that we started the Krebs cycle for. And that's why it's called a cycle. Let me see where I can put that so it's not blocking the way. And that is, we end up where we started. Why it's called a cycle. It just endlessly goes around and around as long as uh, acetyl coenzyme A is entering the cycle. And then the two carbons of acetyl coenzyme A are converted into CO2, one right here and one right there. And that means, uh, well, let me mention this, the uh, preparatory step and the Krebs cycle run two times for every molecule of glucose. And we have three CO2s from one cycle of the preparatory step, one right here uh, one right here in the Krebs cycle, and another one right here in the Krebs cycle. And then these cycles run twice for a molecule of glucose. So all of the carbons, six carbons of glucose, are converted into CO2. Any question about that? So all of the carbons of glucose are burned into CO2. And that's why we breathe out CO2 is because of aerobic respiration. All right, so in the uh, preparatory step in the Krebs cycle, that's what this slide is showing you. Let me end the show here and then you can read that. We generate one ATP for one cycle right here. 4 NADH, uh, one right here, one right here, one right here, one right here, one FADH2 right here, and I already talked about the carbons. And so for one cycle of the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle, <clears throat> you get <clears throat> what's shown in the red box. Remember for glucose, you're going to run the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle two times, and so you'll double these numbers, not one ATP, but two, and then eight NADH, and then two FADH2, and then six carbons. The NADH, as well as the H+, plus that are generated when we generate NADH, and the FADH2 are destined to carry the electrons that came from glucose to the electron transport chain or the ETC. Okay. So for a molecule of glucose, we generate two ATP from uh, uh, the Krebs cycle. Remember, we generated two ATP in the glycolysis. So we've only generated four ATP for a molecule of glucose. And aerobic respiration generates a lot more than four. What happens is the, the electrons flow in the NADH and the FADH2, the electron transport chain, and that's where we make the majority of the ATP. Any question about that? Uh, in eukaryotes, remember, the Krebs cycle happens inside the mitochondria. Uh, and then the electrons, NADH, coming from glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, 
and FADH2 not shown coming from the Krebs cycle. Take the electrons to the electron transport chain. Those electrons will then flow to oxygen, which will be converted into water. And in the electron transport chain, we generate a large amount of ATP. Uh, the electron transport chain has some other names. Uh, it's a series of carrier molecules that are in turn reduced and oxidized as the electrons that flowed from glucose are passed down the chain. The energy is released as the electrons are moving from uh, the high energy molecules to the lower energy molecules. And what I mean is in the chain of molecules, in the electron transport chain, the electron flows to the first molecule, it's a protein, and then it moves to the next one, and then the next one in the chain of molecules, until at the very end it leaves the electron transport chain and flows to oxygen. And each time the electron moves, it loses a little bit of energy. The energy is released in controlled ways, and it's released by chemiosmosis to produce ATP. And this uses flash. Let me see if I can get it to run. Uh, I'm just going to copy it. Uh, I'll go ahead and run it here because I can't open a new one without getting it out of here. Oops, that didn't transfer. Hmm. All right, let me try it again. I can't see it. There we go. Sort of. <laughs> ah! I'm having trouble. All right, it's running. Oh dear, it doesn't look like it's going to run. Um, let me try it in another browser. Sorry with this, I gotta stop the share here because uh, I can't control my. Uh, ah, crud. All right, I'm gonna have to ask you guys to view it on your own unless I can get it to run here. That that's where it was trying to run. Let's go here. I know you're not gonna see this if it runs. Yeah, it's doing the same thing here. So for some reason, I'm not able to run Flash now. Yeah, it's going to say Flash, end of life. Uh, you can't see that, but uh, uh, I'm afraid that video, I can't show it to you. So uh, uh, it was going to show you a little movie on the electron transport chain. Let's see if I can go to YouTube and just find one. I know you're not seeing this. Why didn't that go to YouTube? Oh, fudge. I'm having trouble getting into YouTube for some reason. I know you can't see that, but there we go. Nope, that's still not going to YouTube. Why is that not going to YouTube? All right, uh, come on. All right, let me turn on the uh, viewer, share the screen. If you see a small one, oh, here's a small one, let's go to there. 
I think this is the one I have later on. The electron transport chain is a series of protein complexes embedded in the mitochondrial membrane. Electrons captured from donor molecules are transferred through these complexes. Coupled with this transfer is the pumping of hydrogen ions. This pumping generates the gradient used by the ATP synthase complex to synthesize ATP. The following complexes are found in the electron transport chain. NADH dehydrogenase, cytochrome BC1, cytochrome oxidase, and the complex that makes ATP, ATP synthase. In addition to these complexes, two mobile carriers are also involved, ubiquinone and cytochrome C. Other key components in this process are NADH and the electrons from it, hydrogen ions, molecular oxygen, water, and ADP and PI, which combine to form ATP. At the start of the electron transport chain, two electrons are passed from NADH into the NADH dehydrogenase complex. Coupled with this transfer is the pumping of one hydrogen ion for each electron. Next, the two electrons are transferred to ubiquinone. Ubiquinone is called a mobile transfer molecule because it moves the electrons to the cytochrome BC1 complex. Each electron is then passed from the cytochrome BC1 complex to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C accepts each electron one at a time. One hydrogen ion is pumped through the complex as each electron is transferred. The next... You don't need to know the names of the uh, molecules in the electron transport chain. The major step occurs in the cytochrome oxidase complex. This step requires four electrons. These four electrons interact with a molecular oxygen molecule and eight hydrogen ions. The four electrons, four of the hydrogen ions, and the molecular oxygen are used to form two water molecules. The other four hydrogen ions are pumped across the membrane. This series of hydrogen pumping steps creates a gradient. The potential energy in this gradient is used by ATP synthase to make ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. The ATP synthesis steps you see here are discussed in greater detail in the ATP synthase gradients animation. All right, any questions about this little video? This animation illustrates two full cycles of electron donation. In biological no. systems, however, many electron transport cycles occur simultaneously helping to ensure that the proton gradient is always maintained. All right, I think I've got that link later on, but if not, um, let me uh, copy this web page and put it on the, in the, in the slide and I'll try and update this because that one's not working. I'm going to end this. And let's move that over here. I'm going to put that there. I'm going to get rid of this. Oh, I didn't read that. There's another link on the uh, YouTube web channel. Uh, anyways, let's put that there. And, oops, let me get it out of there. Oh, I see what I'm doing. This needs to go back up there. Alright, so this is uh, 5KW, in case I've got another link that shows it. So, let's talk a little bit more about the electron transport chain in eukaryotes. It occurs along the inner mitochondrial membrane. 
So the electron transport chain is a chain of proteins in a membrane. And in eukaryotes, this membrane is the inner mitochondrial membrane. Any question about that? No, prokaryotes do not have a mitochondria. So the electron transport chain cannot happen in the inner mitochondrial membrane of, of the mitochondria. Uh, in prokaryotes, the electron transport chain happens on the cell membrane. Uh, there is an electron transport chain in prokaryotes, and they do perform aerobic respiration, and the electron transport chain happens on the cell membrane. And these proteins in a prokaryote are actually in the... Uh, in the cell membrane. And this picture is showing you an overview of what's happening. Let's see if I can blow this up. I'll just blow it up here. Uh, the electrons are flowing from glucose and they're carried by NADH and FADH2. You note that NADH delivers the electrons to the first protein in the electron transport chain. You can put that as part of it, but it's not exactly part of the electron transport chain. Uh, the FADH2 do not. They send the electrons to the second protein in the chain. And that's important because the first protein, when it receives those electrons, the electrons move across the protein and then flow to the second protein. And while those electrons are moving, they give this protein the energy it needs to pump a hydrogen ion from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. FADH2, on the other hand, doesn't give the electrons to this protein. It gives it to the next protein in the electron transport chain. So NADH is more efficient at pumping hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. And then NADH and FADH2 can pump hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane, also at this protein in the membrane and this protein in the membrane. These proteins do not pump hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. And you don't need to know the names of these proteins. Uh, the video did tell you the names, but we're not going to discuss them. The electron transport chain, what it's doing is taking those electrons from glucose and then using them to transport hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. The electrons then leave the last protein in the electron transport chain and the electrons flow to oxygen. So oxygen is the final electron acceptor. The oxygen gains two electrons and two hydrogen ions, and then it's converted into water. And that's why you need to breathe, because you need to, to send your cells oxygen so that they can perform uh, aerobic respiration. And then that oxygen is not converted into CO2. It is converted into water. Any questions about any of that? Where does the CO2 come from that we breathe out? Come on, we mentioned it just a little while ago. Where does the CO2 come from in aerobic respiration? All right, Krebs I'll cycle. make that quiz questions. Go ahead. The Krebs cycle? Uh, yeah, the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle. And where does the CO2 come from? Meaning what molecule was it? Glycolysis. A pyruvic acid. Yeah, the pyruvic acid. So eventually the carbons came from glucose, which was converted to pyruvic acid. 
and then each of the carbons in peruvic acid was burned into CO2. That's why we breathe out CO2, and here it's showing why we breathe in oxygen. And so if you stop breathing, you can't perform any aerobic respiration. Okay? Any questions about that? Now then, we pumped a whole bunch of hydrogen ions on this side of the membrane. That means that there's more hydrogen on this side of the membrane than that side. And there's more positive charges on this side than that side. That creates a two-fold gradient. And these hydrogen ions are going to move, uh, simply by diffusion, from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. Meaning we have a potential energy difference from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. And we use that potential energy difference to make ATP. When the hydrogen ion moves from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane, it can only move through this protein channel. And this is an ATP synthase molecule. Let me move this a little bit. And so when the hydrogen moves through this protein, to move from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane, uh, the protein takes the energy from that hydrogen ion and takes that energy and, and adds it to ADP and phosphate and then generates ATP. And that is how our cells make the majority of their ATP from aerobic respiration. Any question about that? No. All right. Let me shrink that down a bit. So is that showing you everything? Not really. Uh, so aerobic respiration in the electron transport chain, we generate a large number of ATP molecules per molecule of uh, glucose. In aerobic respiration, eukaryotes generate 32 to 34 ATP molecules. Prokaryotes are a little more efficient. They always generate 34 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. And as I mentioned in aerobic respiration, the molecule that accepts the electrons that we call the final electron acceptor is a molecule of oxygen. And the oxygen combines with hydrogen, these electrons to form water. Okay. Now most eukaryotic cells can only generate 32 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose from the electron transport chain. But the heart, the liver, and the kidney are more efficient, so their cells can generate 34 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. Why do you think the heart, the liver, and the kidney are more efficient than your skin cells, or your nose cells, or your brain cells? Well, here's an easy one. Why do you think your heart's more efficient? What do you know about your heart? It's constantly pumping. It's constantly pumping, at least while you're alive. So it's always working. And so the heart and the liver and the kidney, they're always working. So they're more efficient than your skin cells, which most of the time they're not working. Or your brain cells. Anyone know how often your brain cell is actually working? <laughs> 
No. It's not most of the time. <laughs> okay. I don't remember how low it is, but it's something like around 2% of the time. It only works at 2% efficiency most of the time. Something like that. Uh, your heart is much more efficient, and so it wants to generate more ATP, and it's more efficient. We won't talk about uh, how it's more efficient, but uh, 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 let's see if I have it in the next slide here. Uh, when the NADH is coming from glycolysis in the heart, the liver, and the kidney, the NADH stays as NADH when it goes into the mitochondria. And in all the other cells, the NADH is converted into FADH2. And if you remember, let me show it right here if I can blow that up. NADH is more efficient because it's generating the, uh, giving the electrons to the first protein in the membrane of the uh, chain of membranes, proteins, meaning the electron transport chain. The FADH2 is not as efficient. It uh, sends it, it's not showing it here, but I think it's this protein here. It's either that one or this one. Oh, I can show it up here. It's this one here. Sorry, I, I got it wrong. It wasn't that one. It's this one here, the FADH2 gives the electrons here. And so uh, those cells are more efficient because you, you get more ATP if you have NADH than FADH2 because this, uh, this protein transports hydrogen from this membrane, side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. I'm getting a little confused here. Um, all right, so in the overview of uh, aerobic respiration, we start with glucose. It's converted into pyruvic acid, which goes to the Krebs cycle. Both the glycolysis and the Krebs cycle generate NADH, and then also FADH2 from the Krebs cycle, which take the electrons to the electron transport chain, which kick the production of ATP into high gear for uh, eukaryotic cells. We generate 32 to 34 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. And then the electrons from glucose flow through the proteins in the electron transport chain, and then they finally leave the electron transport chain and then flow to oxygen. So oxygen is the final electron acceptor. The oxygen is converted into water. The hydrogen ions on this side of the membrane come through the uh, membrane right here at ATP synthase, which takes those hydrogen ions and uses their energy to make ATP. Uh, each time the electron moves from one molecule, glucose to NADH, from NADH to, we won't mention the names, but FMN, etc., the electrons lose energy until they uh, are converted, convert oxygen into water. And that's how we uh, control the uh, release of energy in the aerobic respiration. Okay? by a series of oxidation reduction reactions. And along the way, on certain of these molecules, like that one, uh, this one, and that one, we bump the hydrogen ion to this side of the membrane. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about that. I already talked about that, so let's move on. Right here. Uh, in eukaryotes, this happens in the intermitochondrial membrane, and when we're pumping the hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane, in a eukaryote, everything is good because uh, the hydrogen ions are pumped from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane, so the hydrogen ions are in the 
space between the two membranes, between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And that protects the cell. Okay? And then they'll flow through that membrane to make uh, ATP. In a prokaryotic cell, the electron transport chain is on the cell membrane. The hydrogen ions are pumped from this side of the membrane, meaning in the cytoplasm, to this side of the membrane, which is outside of the cell. Okay? And that protects the cell, too, because those hydrogen ions aren't in the cell. Uh, where do you think most of those hydrogen ions stay in a prokaryotic cell before they flow back across the membrane to generate ATP? Where are the majority of those hydrogen ions in a prokaryotic cell? Come on, people. There's two reasons why you should know. You should know about prokaryotes because we've talked about them. And it's also uh, labeled here on the slide. The periplasmic space? Uh, yeah, it's the periplasmic space and the cell wall. And the periplasmic space is just the space between the cell wall and the uh, plasma membrane. So uh, the hydrogen ions are pumped from this side of the membrane. So in prokaryotes, those hydrogen ions are mostly in the cell wall. And uh, that's fine. Because we want them not to go far and then to come back across the membrane right here at ATP synthase. All right, any question about any of that? If not, let's move on. I already talked about that, and I talked about that. Oh, uh, let's mention just a little bit more that uh, when we create a hydrogen ion gradient, meaning more hydrogens on this side than that side, more positive charges on this side than that side, we create a potential energy difference from this side of the membrane to that side, and that's an electrical gradient as well as a hydrogen ion gradient. And that uh, energy difference, potential energy, is used to make the ATP. And that flowing of the hydrogen is called the proton motive force. I don't use this term, but uh, it's in your readings. Um, and chemiosmosis is specifically uh, the process of... Uh, uh, having a higher uh, H plus concentration on this side of the membrane, and so the hydrogen ions move to this side of the membrane through the ATP synthase, and chemiosmosis is uh, exactly where we generate ATP in uh, aerobic respiration, at least in the electron transport chain. Okay? And this is a term I don't really use very much because it's, it's just a part of the electron transport chain. Uh, the electron transport chain has a couple of other names. It's called the electron transport chain as well as electron transfer chain. Electron Let me think about what the heck's the other name. I'm, oh, transfer, no. Transfer chain, electron transport chain. So that's two. Uh, you know, there's two that are familiar, similar to that, and I'm drawing a blank on what the heck it is. Uh, and it's also called oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is a very different name from the electron transport chain. I tend to use electron transport chain, and so does your textbook author, okay? But it could be electron transfer chain, which is so similar that students don't get uh, confused by that. But it's also oxidative phosphorylation, and I don't use this term. I'm only mentioning it 
because some authors will use that term. Okay, any question about that? So aerobic respiration, the final ATP production, meaning ATP accounting for glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain is we generate 36 to 38 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose in a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotes are a little more efficient. They generate 38 ATPs per molecule of glucose. You do need to know the uh, major steps in the electron transport chain, and you do need to know the summarizing step for aerobic respiration. It doesn't occur in one chemical reaction, which is what we're looking at for the summary re equation. Uh, one glucose, C6H12O6, plus six oxygen molecules, plus 38 ADP molecules, and 38 uh, inorganic phosphates are converted into CO2, six CO2 molecules, six water molecules, and 38 ATP molecules. Any question about that? Let me back up a minute. I forgot to mention, I could talk about it there. Let's, let's look at it right there. That's a good one. Um, most of the steps in the aerobic respiration are chemical reactions. Okay? So NADH converting into NAD plus and releasing the hydrogen ion and the electrons, that's a chemical reaction. But there are a few steps which are physical reactions. The two-fold hydrogen ion gradient on this side of the membrane compared to this side of the membrane, and then the flowing of the hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane, those are physical reactions. So aerobic respiration does include a few physical reactions and then many chemical reactions. And to remind you about the difference, a chemical reaction is when a molecule is changed from one form or another, like NADH to NAD+, or when you got your marshmallow and you put it in your fire and it catches on fire, that's a chemical reaction changing it from sugar to carbon meaning you change it to charcoal when you burn it. Any question about that? That's a chemical reaction changing the molecule. A physical reaction does not change the molecule. The hydrogen ions are still hydrogen ions here and here, but they're in a different location. And you can think of the physical reaction as being something like when you change milk cream and sugar into ice cream. It doesn't taste like milk, cream, and sugar anymore. It tastes like ice cream. It's a physical change. And that is you've slowly frozen the milk, the sugar, and the cream and made ice cream. A physical change. Any question about it? All right, I guess you're good, so I'll move on. The point is uh, uh, aerobic respiration has both physical changes, physical reactions, as well as chemical reactions. We talked about that, we talked about that. Uh, another summary equation in terms of aerobic respiration, you do need to know the 
production of ATP molecules in aerobic respiration, each step to a glycolysis, to at the Krebs cycle, and let me blow that up, I can't read it, uh, 34 to 36, is that right? No, uh, 32 to 34 in the electron transport chain, and then the total number is uh, plus 4, 34, if I said that right, uh, to 38. So 36 to 38 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. Any question about that? You should also know that glucose generates two pyruvic acids, and then the carbons in pyruvic acid are converted into CO2. So for each of the six carbon atoms in glucose, we generate six CO2 molecules. And then the oxygen we breathe in is converted into water. So six uh, oxygen molecules are converted into six water molecules. All right, any question about that? Any questions about aerobic respiration? I don't no. think we can finish this lesson, but we'll move on. All right, let's move on to our anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration is similar to aerobic respiration, except the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain is not oxygen. It's an inorganic molecule, such as a nitrate ion or a sulfate ion or a molecule of ion, iron ion, uh, anaerobic respiration does have glycolysis in the Krebs cycle, so those two still occur. And it does have uh, an electron transport chain, but the electron transport chain in anaerobic respiration is shorter. Let me show that. Well, that's not a good one. So it may have fewer proteins than we have shown here. And usually in anaerobic respiration, the, if the proteins are missing, it's the earlier ones that are missing. And so they generate, uh, they, they, they generate less hydrogen ion moving across from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. So they generate less ATP. I got that someplace here. I went too far. Uh, ATP production in anaerobic respiration depends on what form of anaerobic respiration it is, but it will be somewhere between 2 ATP and 36 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. So this one, anaerobic respiration, is almost as efficient as aerobic respiration, but this one is very inefficient. And then there's others that are in between 2 and 36 uh, ATP per molecule of glucose. So because anaerobes do not make as much ATP as aerobes, anaerobes tend to grow slower than aerobes. And that means a, an organism that performs anaerobic respiration will grow slower than an organism that can, that can perform aerobic respiration. Like E. coli can perform aerobic respiration, and it's one of the fastest growing bacteria that we know of. All right, any questions about any of that? All right, so we've talked about the two different types of respiration now. Let's move on to fermentation. Cells, particularly bacteria cells, can perform or make ATP from glucose using a fermentation instead of respiration. 
and your muscle cells can also perform uh, fermentation to make ATP rather than uh, uh, aerobic respiration. And your muscle cells will use fermentation whenever uh, oxygen is limited, meaning whenever you're really using your muscle and it's uh, using all the oxygen and the muscle instead of not working, it will continue making ATP by fermentation. And your muscles do this by lactic acid fermentation. We'll talk more about uh, fermentation. Uh, actually, this is the start of the worksheet five, so I'm not going to discuss it other than that fermentation does make ATP, but not much. It makes uh, ATP only in glycolysis. So for a molecule of glucose, we only generate two ATP molecules when we perform fermentation from a molecule of glucose. And you're doing fermentation in the uh, worksheet. Oh, we are going to finish this lesson. Uh, and then in the worksheet, we're looking at the integration of metabolism. And we've discussed metabolism as being one way, like uh, glucose is converted into pyruvic acid. But many of the reactions in our cells are actually amphibolic, meaning it can go both ways. The reaction can flow this way, but it can also flow this way. Okay? And in a way, you know this because I told you when we eat like a high fat or high protein diet, those of us who are couch potatoes, we convert those molecules typically into glucose or something similar. And then the glucose will enter uh, aerobic respiration in the normal way. And then carbohydrates typically are always converted into glucose and then uh, enter aerobic respiration that way. Uh, if you're a marathon runner, you can convert fat. I mean, you can burn fat in aerobic respiration, but a marathon runner does not do that until they ran for 45 minutes in their marathon run. So for the first 45 minutes, they don't burn fat. They will be... Uh, burning glucose or carbohydrates or converting the fat into glucose and then burning it that way. But after 45 minutes, the body will need more energy and the marathon runner will directly burn fat. And uh, let me see if I can blow this up a little bit. We'll just talk a little bit about lipids. Uh, they can be converted into fatty acids and glycerol. Glycerol does enter a little bit of a low down, oops, too far. Low down in glycolysis, the glycerol enters right here and then comes into the lower part of glycolysis. The lipids are converted into two carbon uh, chains, which then are converted into acetyl coenzyme A and enter the Krebs cycle. Okay? And <clears throat> as you know, if you eat too much sugar or something like that, our cells are very good at converting that sugar into glycerol and fatty acids and then storing that as lipids. So these reactions can go backwards. And our cells are not very good at going backwards, meaning we can do it for some reactions, but not all reactions. For these, we do it for most of them, but we can't do it for all of them. Okay, the green plants and many prokaryotic cells are much more efficient at 
going backwards than we are. A green plant can make every molecule that they need, starting from glucose, CO2, and water. Okay? And that includes things like vitamins and other nutrients that humans need to eat. Uh, like, ah, uh, 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 I forgot that amino acid. What's an amino acid that starts with an L? Is it lysase? No, that's an enzyme. There's an amino acid that starts with an L, and we need to eat it in our diet. And uh, it's called an essential... Lysine. Say again? Lysine. Lysine, thank you, that's it. Uh, that's an amino acid we have to eat in our diet because we cannot make it. We can only go metabolize lysine. We cannot go backwards making that amino acid. Many of the amino acids we can go backwards, like uh, phenylalanine and tryptophan. We can go from one to another, okay? We can make one from the other. But lysine we cannot make. And so we need to get it in our diet. And that's true for all essential amino acids, all essential fatty acids, and all vitamins. Although vitamin D is a little bit of an exception. You can make it as long as you expose your sun to, to uh, sunlight. All right. But the point is, uh, uh, there are such things as amphibolic chemical reactions. I haven't discussed them that way because it's just too complex. I talked about them only going one way. Uh, let's briefly talk about photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the conversion of light energy into chemical energy. Usually that chemical energy uh, the cell makes uh, is... Uh, uh, glucose, but it can be ATP and NADPH. You don't need to know the second one. We'll talk about ATP. The chemical energy usually is used to convert CO2 into glucose. We call that carbon fixation. And this happens in green plants. I think everybody knows that. But it also happens in algae. And a lot of bacteria, including cyanobacteria. And this is a mechanism for synthesizing organic compounds. And photosynthesis can be used to also make ATP. Now, we can't do that, but these organisms can make ATP using photosynthesis. Uh, and photosynthetic organisms contain a light trapping pigment. You know one of them, chlorophyll. What happens is light hits the chlorophyll and then releases an electron from the chlorophyll. And then that electron is used to make ATP or NADPH. And these molecules are frequently used to make glucose from CO2 and water. So the light energy is converted into ATP and this one, and those may be converted into glucose. Now you all know about non-cyclic photosynthesis. That's where <clears throat> six carbon dioxide molecules and 12 water molecules and light generate six uh, excuse me, glucose, C6, H12, O6, six water molecules, and uh, six oxygen molecules. You need to know this one, non-cyclic photosynthesis. But let me tell you, there's an a, a anaerobic phototrophs, and they do not generate any oxygen. That's why we call them anaerobic phototrophs. You don't need to know this chemical reaction. But you do need to know that there's both non-cyclic photosynthesis, which generates glucose, and then there's cyclic photosynthesis that does not generate glucose, 
it only generates ATP. All cells that are photosynthetic can perform both cyclic photosynthesis and non-cyclic photosynthesis. If the cell wants glucose, it'll perform non-cyclic photosynthesis. On the other hand, if the cell wants to uh, doesn't want glucose but wants ATP, it'll form cyclic photosynthesis to generate ATP. Any question about that? So yes, green plants can do both types of photosynthesis. Uh, let's talk a little bit <clears throat> more about cyclic photosynthesis. Light. Can you go back a second to the other slide, please? Thank you. Can I move forward? Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, what happens in cyclic photosynthesis, light, it's chlorophyll, which isn't shown here in this photosystem, and the light causes an electron to move from the chlorophyll. The light moves to this protein in a membrane, to that protein in the membrane, to that protein in a membrane, and then back to chlorophyll. Why it's called cyclic photophosphorylation or cyclic photosynthesis. The electron moves in a cycle, returning to where it started. Okay? While the electron is moving through this protein, it gives the protein the energy it needs to pump hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. That creates a twofold hydrogen ion gradient. There's more H over here and there's more uh, plus over here. And that energy difference is used to make ATP, the hydrogen ion flows through the membrane at this protein here, and that's an ATP synthase. And when hydrogen flows through this protein, it gives the energy this protein needs to make ATP. This should be familiar to you because this is very similar to aerobic respiration in the electron transport chain. This membrane in eukaryotes is the chloroplast inner mitochondrial membrane. And in, uh, in prokaryotes, it's the cell membrane. So in prokaryotes, this is inside the cell and this is outside the cell. For eukaryotes, this is inside the chloroplast. That's uh, between the inner chloroplast membrane and the outer chloroplast membrane. Okay, any questions about that? We're a minute over. Uh, let's just talk about this last slide and then I'll end. Uh, requirements of ATP production. We noticed with making ATP that the energy source can vary. It can be the sun in photosynthetic organisms, which make ATP, or we can use glucose for like animals or bacteria, or some other chemical agent like elemental sulfur, ammonia, or hydrogen gas in the chemosynthetic bacteria to make glucose. The electron carrier molecules can change we're not going to talk about that, but we generate ATP. And then the final electron acceptor can also change. For aerobic respiration, it'll be oxygen for the final electron acceptor. For anaerobic respiration, it'll be a molecule other than oxygen. For fermentation, it will be an organic compound uh, like lactic acid. It's actually the pyruvate that accepts the electron. Uh, and then for uh, uh, cyclic uh, photosynthesis, it's the chlorophyll. It's both the, uh, where the electron came from 
and the final electron acceptor. All right, any question about any of these? All right, if there's no questions, I'll see you at 6.30 for the lab.